Welcome everybody. Hello. So glad you could join us again today. Hello, hello everybody. I'm so excited to see you again today. I am having the best time and I'm going to go through some major withdrawal when I am done with this week with our Georgia workshop series. So I'm kind of looking forward, well, I am looking forward to this every single day. So I'm so glad you could join us again today. I know I have heard from some people who really wanted to be here today. Some might be joining us late. Some um, let me know that they just aren't able to join today, but we are recording. So we will absolutely send this out uh, after it'll be sometime tomorrow when you receive this. And we are also curating all of the Georgia workshop uh, workshop workshop series uh, recordings into a playlist. And so you'll all have access to that as well. So welcome again. I'm just sort of talking slowly, see if we have anybody else join us right away here at the beginning. And while we're getting settled in for our rural CS workshop today, um, I will take a moment to introduce myself. So my name is Lori and I am a PD specialist here at Code HS. And I've been here at Code HS for about three and a half years now. And prior to coming to Code HS, I used Code HS in my very own classroom from about 2014 to 2019. And so I am still, I, I still describe myself as a fangirl of Code HS. So I'm thrilled anytime I can come together with a group of teachers and talk about using the platform and uh, how you all use it too. And I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Dave. Dave is also on the PD team. Dave, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, welcome everybody. I am also a teacher. I taught 15 years in the Chicago area. And before that, I was in computer science and information technology. And the last four years of teaching, I was also a Code H user and went from a skeptic uh, to huge fan and now at Code HS. And we are so glad you're at Code HS, Dave. And let's see, we've got a couple more people joining. So we are so very excited to have you today. Looks like we're still connecting to audio, so no worries. All right, now, as we're getting settled in, I'm gonna throw this introduction slide up on the screen. We would love to know where you're joining us from today. You can go ahead and toss your introductions into chat. I recognize these names, so I'm very excited you could join us again. Um, but yeah, let's uh, go ahead and share anything you'd like to share about yourself. If you'd like to tell us where you teach, that would be fine. If you'd like to tell us what you teach, that would be great as well. Um, how, what is your experience with Code HS? Are you completely new to the platform? Um, we've had a lot of really, really new teachers this week. And so that's been really exciting. I love it when we have new teachers using the platform for the first time. And I love seeing how excited everybody gets. Hey, Cassie, it's good to see you. Oh, from GA Connections Academy, awesome. And you're new to Code HS. I love it. Yay. We will get you situated and ready to use Code HS however you'd like to. Hi, Laura. It's good to see you. Awesome. So you're in Carroll County Schools and you used for one student last year. Love that. You know, that was how I started using Code HS uh, myself was uh, we actually started um, we were making a transition in my school district from a Windows one-to-one -one program to a Chromebook one-to-one -one program. And I panicked because I thought, now what do I do? How do I teach computer science? How do I teach programming? And that was when I found Code HS. And I actually also had a student come to me who had never had an opportunity to take a programming class with me before. And he was graduating, really wanted to take it. And so we both I set up Code HS and we both went through the Intro to CS course and we were hooked, both of us, very quickly. And by the end of that semester, I actually had uh, this student and two of his friends join me every day during their study hall so they could learn programming for no credit. It was the best experience and I was completely hooked. Hi, Jeffrey. It's so good to see you. I was thinking you were a new CS teacher as well. I was trying to remember from your introduction. So I'm so glad you're back with us today. So good to have all of you here. Um, and I mentioned before, we're gonna, we may have a few people uh, wandering in and out of this session. Uh, so this is perfect. We actually have a great size. We're going to be uh, recording this so everybody can have access to the recording. And if you all have questions as we go, 
please go ahead and toss those into chat. If you're feeling comfortable unmuting your mic and telling me your question or your comment, or you have something to share, please feel free to do that as well. Um, know that we are recording. Um, so I do want to uh, make sure you keep that in mind if you're uncomfortable uh, unmuting at all. So but whatever you would like, uh, however you would like to do that is just fine with me. This is about you and your learning experience. So whatever questions you have, we're going to try to address today. Oh, that is such a good question, Jeffrey. So how long does it take to become a Code HS certified educator? It is not a bad process at all. I was a certified educator. Dave, were you a certified educator? I can't remember. I was not. I was not, but I'm, I just shared the link and I'll share it with everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe you weren't a I was a rookie. Yeah, I should have done it. <laughs> I'm disappointed. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> No, it's a great experience. And I would highly suggest no matter what level of experience you are at uh, for Code HS, go ahead and look into it. Um, people get excited about using Code HS and joining the Certified Educator Program. And we're not looking for somebody who has years of experience. If you're excited about teaching CS and you want to connect with other CS teachers and the Code HS team, we would love to have you as part of the program. So that would be amazing to see all of you jump into that. All right, I'm gonna keep on going because we have a ton of info that I wanna share with you today. Uh, so first of all, we have our link for our slides today. So all of the links that we're gonna be using during our workshop today will be found in the slides. And Dave is gonna be helping me out and tossing some links into chat for me today as well. So if you're in a good place where you can grab that link or click that link to access the slides, you may want to do that. CodeHS.com slash GA dash rural dash slides. Or you can always scan the QR code if it's easier to take a look at those on a mobile device as well. I'll leave this here for just a moment. We uh, will be talking more about some of the pathways, the Georgia pathways. I always mention this, but I truly mean it. I am so very impressed with what the state of Georgia is doing with computer science. Um, I There's so many pathways, and I love that there's such a focus on ensuring that all students in Georgia have access to computer science. Um, that is definitely not the case in all states. It unfortunately is not the case in my state. Um, there's certainly computer science and some very dedicated computer science educators, um, but I'd love to see this kind of robust pathway and set of courses available for students like you all have. So this is a pretty amazing situation that you, you all have. Yeah, you know, and I saw that statistic too, Dave. Dave just threw into chat that uh, there was a recent Gallup poll that tells us that about 55% of high schools in the United States offer computer science. Um, it seems crazy to me that we're still just at that number for computer science. Yeah, only 5% of the students in high school take CS. It's, or in high school take CS, yeah. It's just, those are crazy numbers. Um, but I think part of our issue lies in uh, some of the other percentages that we're gonna take a look at today. Um, this is our rural CS session, and so we're going to take a look at some of those stats as well. I am from a very rural state. I'm from South Dakota. I'm based in South Dakota yet, and I actually taught at a, well, most of the state is rural, but I taught at an even more rural school district. Um, it's probably considered about mid-sized for the state of South Dakota, but geographically speaking, it's very sparse and I was very separated from so many other schools and school districts and towns and even large urban areas. Um, so I definitely understand some of those challenges that, uh, that we are gonna be talking about today. All right, and I think you all have an account, but just in case not, I would love for you to take a second to browse out to codehs.com slash sign up. And that's only if you do not have an account. If you have an existing account, please go ahead and sign in to your CodeHS account. This takes just a moment to sign up. 
couple of minutes, maybe a little longer than a moment. <laughs> And if you are just signing up for the first time today, know that we do go through a process of verification for any new educator accounts, just to make sure that we're not giving students access to solutions and all those other cool things that teachers get. For our new Code HS teachers or our new CS teachers also, I just also want to reiterate that this is a free teacher account. You never need to pay to use a pro account with Code HS. Code HS does have a free and a pro plan. And uh, for all teachers, free or pro, you have access to all of the Code HS courses in our course catalog. That includes all of the all of the computer science courses, the programming courses, and all of the state courses. And you're going to see that Georgia has a lot of state courses that we've created and you have access to all of those. We do not restrict you from having any access or having access to any of that content. All right, now, this is the same session that we have used Monday and Tuesday as well. So if you were in one of the prior sessions, you do not need to re-enroll in the workshop section. However, if you're joining us for the first time or you didn't have an opportunity to enroll, Go ahead and uh, sign into Code HS, then click that link that Dave threw into chat for us. CodeHS.com slash go slash GA2023. If I click it, it's going to look something like this. You will see the list of teacher, my teacher friends have just grown <laughs> in this course. And this is actually something that I want to show you all how to do today. Um, I think this is this is probably something I should just be showing everybody in all of the workshops because I think so often computer science teachers especially have uh, a real a real situation where you are maybe the only computer science teacher in your district. Maybe you are a transplant into teaching computer science, um, but there's such a sense of isolation sometimes when you teach computer science and sometimes being able to have a co-teaching situation with colleagues from other areas is a really pretty amazing thing. This is actually something I used to do too. And so I'm gonna show all of you how to uh, add co-teachers to your Code HS classes today. Let's see how we're doing over here. We've had anybody new join us. All righty. If anybody has any questions about joining, um, don't hesitate to let me know. You can go ahead and drop a note in chat and we can help get you in there. We can always enroll you manually as well. And any of the links that we access from the section today will not be accessible unless you've enrolled in the section. And if you don't want to be in the section after today, you don't have to be. We can always take you out. You can always remove yourself as well. Inside of the section, you're going to see a few things. You're going to see a lot of content. So we did just have the intro, uh, the the workshop about intro to software technologies and intro to hardware technologies. So we're adding a lot of stuff. <laughs> you're going to see a lot of content you can try out. But you can also see this module at the top of the content called Georgia Summer Workshop Resources. I'm going to curate everything here. So you're going to have access to all of the content for all the workshops here as well. And I think I'll also go ahead and add those, um, the recordings here. I'll send those recordings out to everybody as well through email, but I'll add them here too. All right. One more link. Okay, once you've signed into Code HS, then you can go ahead and click on the attendance link. And Dave has just thrown that into chat as well. So you can click on codehs.com slash GA dash rural dash attend. And that is going to let me know that you are here. You know, I can see you, but it's going to put you in my list. And as soon as this workshop is over, I'm going to head out and I'm going to send you all certificates of attendance for coming today. So if you can use those for your districts, by all means, we want you to be able to do that. 
it will look something like this when you click the link. If you're signed in, this is what you should see. Nothing else that needs to happen. All right, so I'm going to do just a quick little overview of what exactly is Code HS. Some of you I know have heard this story before, so I apologize, but it's still a fun story and I do like to tell it, so I'm going to jump into this quickly. So what I want you to think about with Code HS is that we are a comprehensive platform for teaching computer science. And one of these times, Dave, I'm going to remember to come back in and change that slide because I forgot to put K-12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I changed it at one spot and didn't move it there. But we are a comprehensive platform for teaching computer science in elementary, middle, and high schools. Yes, it is K-12. And I did mark it here, so I'm getting closer. But so, um, yeah, the elementary side of things is pretty new um, for us. It's not, uh, we've only been doing that for a couple of years now. So, but we absolutely have a ton of curriculum available that you can use with your kids. And I think we mainly have middle school, high school teachers with us today. If I'm incorrect on that, I'm sorry about that. Um, but you are going to be so excited about all the courses that we have available for middle school and high school, including those Georgia courses. And you'll get a chance to see some of the tools and resources today as well. And I'm hoping that we've got a little bit of time today because I'd really like to walk through the process of setting up your own courses and sections so you can start playing with those as well. So our story at Code HS. So this in the top right hand corner of my screen is Jeremy Keishan and Zach Gallant. And Jeremy and Zach met in their freshman year at Stanford. And they met while they were teaching intro to computer science classes. And they actually built some of the tools that were used in the courses. Um, what they actually found during that time was that so many of their classmates had never experienced computer science. They didn't even have access to a computer science course as they were coming up through high school. And Stanford was their first experience with that. And they felt that was wrong. And we agree with them because computer science and programming is foundational. So they wanted to ensure that all teachers and all students would have access to high quality computer science and programming curriculum. So in their senior year at Stanford in 2012, they founded Code HS and they got that cool little van down in the corner in pink. And there's Carol the dog sitting on top of the van. And they made a couple of road trips all around the US where they visited hundreds of classrooms. And I have so many teachers who still send me pictures and tell me, Lori, I remember when they came to my school, it was so great. And I've seen newspaper clippings and everything, but that was the start of Code HS. It all started because of a mission, a mission that these two uh, really felt really strongly about, and it was their passion project. So love that story. And I love to share that with kids too, because it does inspire them that, hey, something I'm doing when I'm so young could impact so many. So love to share that story. And our mission was, is, and always will be, we want to empower all students to meaningfully impact the future. So read, write code. We believe that programming and computer science is a foundational subject and it should be considered a core subject in all schools. So once again, kudos to the state of Georgia for understanding that and seeing the importance in that as well. So let's go ahead and get into our uh, session today. So I, let me see. So you've mentioned where you are joining from and I've familiarized myself a little bit with the map of Georgia counties. Um, but I would love to know what your idea of rural is. Do you see yourself as a rural school teacher? There's a lot of different definitions of rural. One of the interesting things that I found just in talking to other teachers and other colleagues here at Code HS is that rural does not mean the same thing to all people, of course. In fact, even with uh, NCES educational statistics, there's actually a category for rural and there's a category for town, but both of those really are can get combined 
and thought of as almost the same kind of way. So what do you feel like you are a rural teacher or are you teaching in a larger district? You know, I am very rural. In fact, I right now where I am at this point, if I look out my window, I cannot see neighbors. So I am quite rural. I do not have a school district in my nearest town. And in fact, my township has about 150 people in it. If I go 15 miles to the north, I will get to the next school district, which has a very tiny school. Um, I think there's maybe 120 students K-12. Yeah, it's about 120 students K-12. Um, and if I go about 20 minutes in, in the southern direction, I will actually get to the third largest town in Aberdeen or in Aberdeen in South Dakota, it's Aberdeen, but it's uh, still very, very small. But what I find is that when I talk to teachers from other states, their idea of rural is something very different. Um, your school might be small, but you might just simply be not in a close proximity to another larger district. You might have a very small town that's near you. So this is significant when we think about rural school districts, because the percent of rural school districts in the United States is actually pretty large. It's a pretty significant uh, percentage, 36,770 school districts. And this is considering that rural and town designation together because both technically are pretty rural. They're pretty far from being considered a city or a suburban school. So this accounts for about 42% of the school districts in all of the United States. And I found this really interesting uh, data from the state of Georgia as well that shows that 40.5% of the population in Georgia is rural. So almost half of Georgia, there's a significant percentage that is rural. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on, if you click on the map, can actually head out to this page. It came from the Office of Rural Education and Innovation. And if we scroll down, you're gonna see this map here and it's interactive. So this is kind of cool to just be able to take a look at the different populations that you're gonna see. Anything in green is considered a rural district. Um, so of course, you know, you have Fulton and Gwinnett and Atlanta, the things that aren't very rural um, or the counties that aren't very rural, but Heard County. 11,923. Uh, Randolph, 6,778. And is that where, that's Southwest, yep, Southwest Georgia STEM Academy. So these are all considered very rural districts. And it will even show you where the different uh, regional educational service agencies are. And you can get additional information about each of these counties over here. So it's some really interesting information to see just how much is rural in the state of Georgia. And this is really impactful information because rural schools have a much different set of challenges that uh, they deal with. Some of those challenges even include a much more significant level of poverty than what we see in urban centers. I know for myself in my state, uh, levels of poverty in uh, some of the really rural areas are more of like a 14, 15% while the rest of the state is at 8%. And the same can be said for Georgia as well. So some other interesting statistics before we get into some more of the content of our workshop today. So 85.3% of Georgia high school students attend a school that offers foundational computer science. 85.3%, that number is awesome. But 3.6% of students are enrolled in a computer science course. That is a huge discrepancy. And this is just in general. This doesn't have to do with rural or urban. It's just simply across the state of Georgia. And this comes from the 2022 State of Computer Science Education Report. And even in, more interesting, I think, is 28.6% of students enrolled in a computer science course are female. So some interesting statistics to think about there. So there's plenty of computer science available, but our students aren't enrolled in those courses. 
And when we start applying that information to rural districts, even though we have access, and this chart is, is, is showing us uh, what the exposure to CS uh, classes is in a rural district, we have some good exposure, but keep in mind that number of students who are actually participating. It's low, it's very, very low. Oops, you can see the whole report by clicking on it. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know where I'm clicking anymore. So there we go. So some of the problems facing rural districts just are very unique. They're just unique compared to urban schools. So there is a definite lack of exposure to CS in rural communities, just in the community itself. And this is something I hadn't really thought about before I started doing a lot of research into this. But in rural communities, there is just simply less exposure to topics of computer science. There's less exposure to programming. There's less exposure to uh, fields, occupational fields that use computer science. There's simply less exposure to it. And so students are not even seeing it in their community. Um, so when they see it in education, they may not even realize what it is, or it may translate into a lack of access. Because if there is lack of CS in the entire community, that may very well translate into a lack of access for CS in schools as well. So that in itself is a huge issue for providing access to our kids. Also interestingly is that in many parts of the US, rural populations are growing faster than urban populations, which seems strange. I feel like they won't be rural if the populations are growing faster. <laughs> But they are growing faster. And along with that come a lot of issues with infrastructure, uh, poverty rates rising, and other things like that. So there's some pretty significant issues for rural school districts and rural communities. And these are all things that are going to impact us in a huge way because, what, a third of the schools, a little more than that, are rural. So some of the barriers to CS, and I think a lot of these that I've listed here too, these are not just barriers to CS in rural communities. These are barriers in CS. I think that truly this could be a session that focuses on barriers to CS education because teachers who are teaching computer science often feel these kind of things regardless of whether you're rural or urban. So some things that really impact CS are things like scheduling constraints. If you are in a small district, you may not have a very flexible schedule. You might have one section of each of the core classes. And so where does CS fit into that to make sure all students have access to it? Access to curriculum, hardware might also be an issue in CS as well. I know this was often an issue for so many teachers that I talked to. And I've also talked to Georgia teachers who said, I just simply don't have the hardware. So that's a huge problem when we're trying to teach something with computers, right? Lack of academic priority is another issue. This one, I, I feel like there is much more priority given to CS in Georgia than what we've seen in other states but this can vary by school as well. Professional development is also a problem. And this is something we've talked about in other uh, workshops this week too. How do teachers who are new to computer science, and this is a very unique computer science problem. How do teachers new to computer science learn computer science so you can teach it to your students? This is a big problem. I was one of those transplant teachers. I did not have... A, I did not go to school to teach computer science. In fact, I tried to avoid a lot of the courses that involve computers because I thought I wasn't good at it. And so I simply had to start from scratch. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. How do we continue connecting? How do we continue learning? Too many demands on teachers' time. Now, this is a problem that impacts all teachers, I think. <laughs> but so often, depending on the size of your school district, uh, you're going to wear 10 different hats, uh, especially in those small school districts. And I know some of you are even teaching multiple different subjects. 
how much does that eat away at the time that you have to give to your computer science kids? And often a lack of funding as well. And I know this, these problems can impact any teacher, but it's a different, unique kind of impact when we're talking about rural communities. All right. So I'm going to jump into our uh, the, the content of our workshop now. So I want to talk a little bit about meeting those curriculum challenges. And there's going to be quite a few for us. So this is a chart that I have, or a set of little bit of data that I've showed at some other workshops as well. But this is a really phenomenal way to take a look at some district-wide approaches and statewide approaches to computer science. This is some data pulled together from uh, the Georgia Department of Education. And if you click the picture, or I think Dave, yep, Dave, did you throw that in there? I think there's a link there. Or actually, I can I'm, grab it. I'm, I'm getting it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Oops, there we go. So I'm going to scroll down to about midway down this page where it says computer science data dashboard. And I'm going to expand that so we can see it a little more closely. I think this is a great way to get a really good idea of what computer science looks like in the state of Georgia. So on this overview page, you're going to see a quick look at the breakdown by gender for those participating in computer science pathways in Georgia. You're also going to see a breakdown of race and ethnicity in Georgia here and the trends. I really love this trend chart because I love the exponential growth that we're seeing there. I don't know if it's quite exponential, but it's a good growth that we're seeing there. <laughs> so you can see in 2012, there were 2,346 students participating in CS in uh, Georgia. And as we go through the years, we can see that climb to 2022 when we have 172,154 students enrolled in CS. That is an amazing number. And I love seeing that kind of shift in computer science enrollment. You can also see all of the courses and all of the CS enrollments throughout the state. And you can break this down by pathways up here as well. There's a built-in filter. And you can take a look at the pathways or you can take a look at the individual states, earth states, counties, to see what the pathways are here. But this is such a good breakdown to really see how computer science is taught in the state of Georgia. Representation is also a really good filter. I like to take a look at this as well. So you can see what is the breakdown again each year for uh, female versus male students with disabilities and race and ethnicity. Um, we can really start to see some huge disparities when we start to look at these. Okay. So I also wanna make sure to share with you the Georgia Computer Science Plan. So this is a really good one to familiarize yourself with. So if you are new to CS, uh, taking a look at this plan and seeing how what, com what Georgia is laying out um, as their big picture overview for computer science is going to be a great, great thing to keep in mind. So definitely have that handy. You will want to bookmark this as they make continue to make changes to this. And I've also linked here all of the CTAE computer science pathways in Georgia. So you're going to see the link here for all of the different pathways. So computer science in Georgia gets added into the CTAE uh, pathways. So I do love that because I think it's a nice approach to really give kids uh, kind of that, not just a bridge to academia, but also to post-secondary success. This is a really good way for them to see themselves and what they can be doing post-secondary. So all of the pathways are listed in the informational technology strand for C the CTAE programs. And you can see here that there's cybersecurity, computer science, financial technology. I love seeing that here. Game design, uh, information support, IoT, programming, web development, cloud computing. And what you'll find here as we start to get into the CodeHS courses is that 
you are going to see um, that CodeHS has courses available for every single pathway. And we've actually fulfilled pathways for, I believe it is computer science and web development. So both of those pathways are complete with CodeHS courses. And another link, there's so many links, the Georgia Guide. This is the CodeHS Georgia Guide to Computer Science. And I like this document as well, because when you scroll down, I think it's about on page seven, you're going to see all the courses, but you're also going to see, there we go, the Georgia IT pathways and the CodeHS courses that actually fulfill those pathways. So you'll see the Georgia IT pathway over here on the left-hand side. You'll see the CodeHS courses that we have built for those pathways. And you can see if CodeHS has a fully aligned course for those pathways. So like I mentioned earlier, computer science, we have courses that are fully aligned for that pathway. And web development also has courses that are fully aligned to this pathway. The other pathways all have at least one course because of those foundational courses, uh, intro to software technology and intro to hardware technology. And then there's also partial alignments for each of these uh, other courses as well. So you can see how CodeHS stacks up in those alignments. There's those two pathways, computer science and web development. And this page is also one you're going to want to hang on to. Absolutely, you want to bookmark the page that Dave just tossed into chat, codehs.com slash states slash GA. I think these are some of the most helpful pages that we have when you're looking for information for your state. This one is going to be really helpful. Um, you're going to see the entire listing of CodeHS courses. So if you missed yesterday's workshop, you'll want to go back and watch that recording. Yesterday's was about transitioning from this intro to digital technology, which, by the way, was retired at the end of June of this past summer. So this one is retired. We're still leaving it in the catalog, but know that it has shifted to something else for the upcoming years. And what has replaced that instead is Georgia Intro to Software Technology and Intro to Hardware Technology as well. And that's what we focused on yesterday. We'll take another little look at some of those activities, but know that that has shifted. And we can scroll down and see some statistics about CES in Georgia. We can also see a suggested 5 through 12 pathway. And by the way, the pathways that are listed here are really focused on uh, making sure our vertical alignment is right for a full K-12 pathway. Um, so we're really focused in on what is the state of Georgia looking at for standards? How are we making sure that we are keeping that alignment really robust so we're engaging students and uh, not repeating content as students go through those uh, different grade levels? But this is the tool that I really want to show all of you. This is often one of the most overlooked tools that we have, I think. And I, I feel like we're talking about it so much now, so teachers might be seeing it more. But it's our standards framework tool. So I know, we all know that teachers, we need to align to the state standards. Well, we've tried to take that lift off of all of you. So you can find any of the Georgia courses and you can see exactly what those standards alignments are here. So you can see, where is the, here we go. Introduction to Software Technology. This is one of the foundational courses. And I think this one is in six or seven of the pathways. I don't recall the exact number, but this one is included in most of the pathways. So if I click on view, there we go. Now you can see the full standards mapping for this course. You're going to see the Georgia standard on the left-hand side. There are 64 standards. And on the right-hand side, you're going to see all of the lessons in this Code HS course that are aligned to these standards. So this is going to be a really handy way to just know and feel confident that you are teaching those standards. Um, the other kind of neat thing here, too, is if you are teaching something that isn't quite fully aligned, like maybe Georgia Advanced Cybersecurity, 
It's at a 76.3% alignment, which isn't too bad. I'd like that to be higher, but it's not quite there yet. So when we click in this, we can see there's 76 standards. 58 of those standards are mapped. And we can even see at the top of the screen that we are aligning to the Code HS Advanced Cybersecurity course. So if you're feeling like, okay, I want to teach cybersecurity, I want to use Code HS, but which course do I choose? You can see that here. You can see I'm going to choose the Advanced Cyber course. Then you can also see those standards on the left-hand side, the lessons that are aligned to each standards. And there's, there we go, there's one that is not aligned. So you can find the lessons that do not have a lesson aligned with them. And you can decide how you want to fill that in. And with some of the customization strategies that we've been talking about, we'll do a little more talking about that today, you can actually add that right into your Code HS lesson. So really handy tool. I completely agree with Dave. You are going to want to bookmark this page, codehs.com slash states slash GA. This is going to be a great place to come to view those standards alignments. Any questions about that? Okay. And then I have a slide about it. So there we go. <laughs> You've got it in a couple spaces. <gasps> And I do want to point this out too, because this is something that actually came up yesterday during our workshop when we were talking about the Code HS courses, especially ID, uh, the IDT that got retired, the new IST and IHT. We do have, oops, this entire other course catalog that includes all of our courses. I thought I made that clickable and I didn't. I'll just type it in. There we go. So in our course catalog, <clears throat> you're gonna see well over a hundred different courses here. So some of the courses that, if you are looking to use Code HS for maybe um, one of the pathways that isn't fully aligned like that cybersecurity course, you can actually come out here to find those other courses as well. Here is advanced cybersecurity. So you can take a look at um, all of the content that is included here. And you can view the syllabus and all of that. And it will be it will be very beneficial if you use the filters up here <laughs> instead of scrolling through them because there are well over a hundred courses now. So you can choose uh, how you want to filter those, or you can simply search for the course that you want. And that will pull up all the cyber content. I do love the cyber content, so I will say that. <laughs> There's one of the Georgia courses that comes up. So, so definitely uh, know how to access that course catalog so you can see any of the other content that's there as well. Oh, and forgot to point out that you can also enroll yourself in any of the courses. So this is one of the little tips. If you are looking for more help with learning computer science or cybersecurity or just going through any of that content uh, before you teach it to your students, on any course, you're going to see some options here. And this enroll option is one of them. If you click enroll, I'll go ahead and click it. I will actually enroll myself in the APCSP and Python course or whatever one I happen to click on. And I can now work through this from the student perspective. So this is a really nice way to gain some experience going through some of the courses. There's some other ways to do that. And I'm gonna help you do that today too when we set up our own courses. Um, and I'll, I do like to point this out too because we are talking to generally some CTE teachers or CTAE teachers in the state of Georgia. I was also a CTE teacher. And one of my concerns was, how do I make sure that I'm making my kids or helping my kids be career ready? I knew some were going to go straight to Votech school. Some were going to go straight to work. And I wanted to make sure they had some of those skills they needed to actually go straight to that successful career pathway. So when you're looking at the Code HS courses, know that so many of the languages that we have in the course catalog are really industry-relevant languages. So JavaScript has been fully updated 
Uh, so actually our new Corgi version has some new syntax changes. And uh, so it's completely updated and uh, ready for your students. Python 3, Java. Java is a huge one. I know so many teachers who use our Java courses and our APCSA courses to prepare kids to take the Oracle certification exams. And so many kids are really ready to step into the career world when they graduate even high school with that certification. C++ is another one that we actually have a couple of courses for now. This could be a really good option, especially if you are, it, let's say that you're teaching maybe uh, APCSA to juniors. Once they get beyond APCSA, they might be looking for something else. C++ could potentially be that something else. HTML5, CSS, MySQL is also an option here too. One of the other things that I forget to mention here as well is that some of the CompT, uh, CompTIA exams like, uh, which one is it? IT Fundamentals Plus. That exam is completely aligned to our Fundamentals of Cybersecurity course. And so you can absolutely help prepare your kids to take those courses as well, or I'm sorry, certifications as well. We mentioned a little bit about vertical alignment, but I'm going to mention it again because this is pretty important when we're thinking about keeping kids engaged in computer science. Um, we know that we we know from research, we know from evidence that the sooner we start kids in computer science, the sooner we expose them to computer science, the more likely they are to be engaged in it and stay engaged and continue participating throughout school. So it's important that we think about that elementary plan for our kids. How do we get computer science into our elementary? And once they're there, how do we keep them engaged throughout their school, their school uh, career? So we really want to think about that vertical alignment process for our kids. And this is where I come back to really thinking about what do those pathways look like for our kids? And again, Georgia does an amazing job with that. The state of Georgia has absolutely put together their own alignments and their own courses and standards for what CS can look like in the state. And so we've also followed that with uh, our own fifth through 12th alignment here. And I wanted to throw this one out here as well. This is a very new tool that we have. So if you're looking for ways, or maybe you're part of a, a, a technology committee where you're talking to, you know, district-wide, you're talking about district-wide implementation of computer science, this pathway, Pathway Builder, is a pretty cool tool that we have. It's very, very new. I think it's two weeks old, maybe three weeks old, super new. But you can actually go through and start looking at how to build a pathway for a district-wide CS implementation. I mentioned that we have elementary uh, curriculum now, and you can definitely see that here. It starts with some great block-based coding to really scaffold and get kids excited about uh, programming. And it has so many interdisciplinary uh, lessons, which is amazing to really make it relevant to their learning. Middle school pathways as well. This one makes me so happy because I am a huge Python fan. <laughs> and so we actually have a lot of Python content now in middle school. And we have even more Python at the high school level now too. We have a full Python pathway. Yay. I would have been so excited to teach all of this. <laughs> so <laughs> I was always looking for more Python content. That is my favorite language. So, um, but now we have it. So you have a lot of options here for building that pathway. So I want to make sure to point this tool out to everybody as well. All right, how are we feeling everybody? Any questions? I'm gonna take a break just to get a drink of water because I'm talking way too much. All right. So I think at this point, what I wanna do I've got some other things I want to talk through, but I have been running out of time in every other workshop. And tomorrow we will go through this process again as we, because um, tomorrow's workshop will be preparing for your school year. But I want to give all of you a little precursor to this process during this session, because then you can actually start playing with some of the content and you can maybe start seeing uh, some of the 
some of the customization and engagement things that we start talking about. So I want to walk through the process of actually creating a course in Code HS and creating a section. So I'm going to skip past the slides for right now, and I'm going to jump out to Code HS. So if you would like to follow along with me and do this as I do it, you certainly can. If it works better for you to watch me the first time, that's completely fine too. So I'm gonna take this slow. And if you need me to slow down, go ahead and toss a message into chat. Or if anything is confusing, let me know and I will slow down. So when you sign into Code HS, typically the first page you come to is the sections page. Now, when you're first creating, your very first course and your first section. We're not gonna start in sections. We're gonna to go to the courses link. So from the navigation pane on the left-hand side of your screen, we're going to click on courses. There we go. Now I have a lot more courses here than what you may have, because I know we do have a lot of new CS teachers uh, participating in these workshops this week. But know that it's fine if you have these courses. It's not going to bog anything down. It's, sometimes it's nice to be able to go back and revisit a course that you may have used. And if nothing has changed in the course from year to year, you can always use that course again. So I'm going to start by creating my course. So we're going to say that I am a new Code HS teacher. I am preparing for my new school year. So I'm going to start by making a course. So now the first thing I want you to keep in mind is that the course is what is going to hold the content. So all those courses that we saw in the course catalog, all of those have curriculum, all those have content with them, right? So the course is going to be the folder that holds all of that content or the box that holds all that content. So I'm going to call this intro to software technology. And I'm going to say it's 23, 24 school year. Now, if I don't like that name, I can always change it later. For now, I'm going to leave it at this and I'm going to click create new course. Now, it takes me to this cool little wizard where I can choose my starting point. So I can either choose to make this course from a template, which would be one of those courses in the course catalog, or I can start from scratch. So I can make a completely empty course shell. And some of you, one of the questions I often get is, why would I do that, Lori? I want stuff in it. <laughs> well, we actually have many teachers and I have a couple of good friends who teach in Georgia who are having to be teacher trainers as well, who create their own courses. Um, one of them has even created a course for uh, the movie Hidden Figures, which is one of the projects that he does uh, to explore his historical figures and especially those uh, those that are underrepresented as we saw in Hidden Figures. So. He created a course from scratch and didn't even use any Code HS content. He just put his own content in it. So you can do that as well. But for our purposes, we are going to choose use a Code HS template. And from here, I'm going to see all the courses that are available. Now, I don't want to search through them. So I'm going to start searching for Georgia. That brings up the whole list. And I'm going to choose Intro to Software Technology. That's one of our uh, foundational courses for your state. And it now made a copy of all of that content. And because I have so many courses here, I can't see it. So I'm going to click sort. And I'm going to say newest to oldest. And that's going to bring up my intro to software technology course. Now from here, I see that I have no sections. I've got this course. So I've got all this content, but I have no sections. The section is going to be where I put my students. So if I'm teaching just one section, maybe one class period, maybe I just have a second period for intro to software technology, I would just need to create one section. But if I'm teaching multiple groups of students, I can create multiple sections. So the sections are how I organize my students. So to make a section, I'm still on the courses page. And I'm gonna move to the right-hand side and I'm going to click on this icon in the center. It looks like an easel. Create a new section. So that starts this little wizard again. And I'm going to name my section.
And I'm going to say this is for period two. And now I'm going to click create. And from here, I can either view the roster, I can view assignments, or I can add another section. So if I'm teaching more than one section, I can add that. But otherwise, I could go to the roster page or see the assignments listed here. I'm going to go ahead and click on view roster. And now that takes me out to my uh, roster page for my intro to software technology class for period two. My students will use this enroll code to join my course, just like you joined our workshop section. They will join the exact same way. And I'll be able to see any of the assignments that I added into the course here. There's my whole IST course. Any questions about that process? One of the common questions we get is, do I have to create a new course every single time? I or Every time there's a new school year or do I need multiple courses? No. No, if you are teaching multiple different courses, so maybe you're doing IST and you're teaching intro to hardware technology and maybe the web development course, then yes, you would create each of those courses. You would want a course for each of the different kinds of content, but you can continue adding sections, multiple sections to each of those courses. Exactly. And I like how Dave explained that in chat. Courses equal curriculum, sections equal students. Okay, course houses curriculum, students or uh, sections house students. All right. I wanted to just show you that we've been getting a lot of questions about it. So I thought we're going to give a little overview of that in this session because I think it's important that you have that to start working with. All right, so let's get back into a little bit more content about engaging students with authentic learning. We want to talk a little bit more about engagement for our students. So these are strategies that can work for not just our rural students, but also our any student, uh, maybe in those urban locations or wherever they might be. We always want to think about how are we going to engage our kids. So some of the things that we can do are going to involve the curriculum that we use. So one of the issues that I've found from time to time, I'm gonna jump back over here and I'm gonna go back into our workshop section really quickly, or as quickly as I can. There we go. So one of the things that I've often heard teachers say is, uh, well, I don't need to customize anything in Code HS. All the stuff is right here and I can just have students start with the video and just go through things. And I've actually had teachers have their kids come into class, sit down, put on their headphones and go through lessons. And I can tell you that while you can do that, I have definitely taught some, some Code HS courses completely online. But when you do that approach, um, students are gonna tune out pretty quickly. And so in order to keep them engaged, we really want to think about how we are approaching our lessons, how we're designing our lessons. And I think what even becomes more important than that is as we're thinking about these lessons and we're thinking about whether our students are rural, where maybe they're pretty isolated from larger population centers, or maybe they are from a larger, a larger school district in, say, Atlanta. So when we're thinking about having our students go through this, we need to think about how do we make this learning authentic for our students? How do we make it relevant to them? It's not always going to be very obvious to our students how this applies to their life or how it could apply to their post-secondary lives and what this could bring to them. And so we need to be thinking about what are we adding for our kids? So some of the things that we can do are some pretty basic customizations. And I've gone through a lot of this in the previous workshops, or I shouldn't say a lot of it. I've started to overview it. Tomorrow is going to be the big day when we really focus in on platform. So I'm just going to point out a few things that we can do here. Some of the things we can really think about is how are we presenting our lessons to our students? We do have this video at the start of all of our lessons. 
we always start with a video or the content of the lesson. One thing that's important to keep in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. And this is something that I constantly surprise teachers with. If, you, if you've used Code HS before, often you may not have seen this handy dandy little slides button up here. So you don't have to have your students watch the video. You can have them, you can do some direct teaching with the slides. So if you're comfortable with the content, you can pull up the slides and actually teach using these slides. You know, and even cooler ideas, another teacher told me how instead of having them teach it, they assigned a lesson to each of their students and the kids taught it from the slides. So they had to decide how they were going to teach it, which I often find is a great way to learn how to code. So that's a really good strategy, I think. So you can choose video or you can choose slides and your kids will see that as well. Then one of the other, oh, the other thing that's really cool here too is if you do like the videos, which I love the videos, but it's nice to be able to change them up too. So we have a lot of teachers who use tools like Edpuzzle or TED Ed Lesson Creator or some of the other tools where you can take a video, import it into another platform and break it down and build in some formative assessment throughout it. So that's another really cool option. And you can do that with all the Code HS videos and re-add them into the course. You can also, oops, that's too zoomed in now. There we go. So you can also move around the content here. So you can organize this any way you'd like. One of the things we started talking about was this check for understanding quiz. And this is a contentious quiz, very contentious. Teachers everywhere will argue, where do I want to put the quiz at? And so sometimes they'll leave it here. They may grade it, they may not grade it. But more often than not, I see teachers moving this quiz or removing it entirely. So if you shift this quiz, let me see if I can, there we go, get everything on the screen. If you shift the quiz to the bottom of the lesson, the last thing in the lesson, you now have an exit ticket. This is a really nice little exit ticket because it is so short. So this is a really good place to add that. You can also click on move to lesson and I could shift this to the start of the next lesson because then I've got a really cool little bell ringer here. Really slick deal, love that. Whoops, there we go. Now it's where I want it, okay. So now I can give my kids a bell ringer before we get into the lesson. So there's a lot of options that you can have. And if you don't wanna use the quiz at all, I can click it and say, remove. And now it's gone, poof, it's out of there. These are all strategies that you can use whether you are a free or a pro teacher. By the way, if you did throw something away and then you decide, oh no, I need it back, where did it go? There's a trash can and you can find it in course settings and you can dig through the trash and pull that right back out. So there's lots of ways to add that back in. And free teachers, I do also like to mention that this is actually a strategy you can use to hide some quizzes from your kids. Um, pro teachers do have access to some really cool course settings. Free teachers, you don't have access to that. But if you don't want your kids to see this end of unit quiz, you can always delete it. And then I can go back and add it back in later. So I wouldn't want to do that all the time. But for some of the big quizzes, that's a little strategy that you can do. So little hint from a former pro or from a former free teacher. <laughs> so, <laughs> so lots of things that you can customize that way. You can also add new lessons here. Um, you can add new activities. There we go. Whoop. Zoom is messing with me. It's giving me a weird message. Dave, let me know if you can't hear me all of a sudden. I think I'm okay yet. No, no, I, you're good. Okay, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Then Zoom's just messing with me for no reason. <laughs> but you can add all of this different content. And what I really like here is that as we go through some of the other resources that you're going to see, you can actually find ways to add in some of that content to really make the content something that's going to be relevant to your kids. And we'll go through these in more detail 
during tomorrow's session. Let's see. Oh, there's one thing that I have not shown to people yet. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of that. So I'm going to go ahead and open up functions in Carol. And one of the things that, and this one is strictly a pro tool. So if you do have a pro license, so let's say I really like the functions in Carol quiz, but I want to add to it, or maybe I want to take something out of it. If I click the three dots on the right-hand side under configure, oops, it's not zooming in. There we go. I can click on fork. And fork is going to allow me to copy this code HS activity. There we go. And now I can actually edit this. So I can add in questions, I can delete questions, or I can change it up. I can do it with quizzes. You can see what it looks like here. I can completely edit this quiz now. Or I can even do it with, say, examples or exercises. So there's a ton of really amazing things you can do here. And when you fork one of these examples, the really cool thing that you can do is actually come in and create an assignment out of it for your students. You can change it up and make an example or make a challenge out of it. So another really cool option for customizing for engagement for your kids. So one of the things I wanted us to think about too is what are some other ways that we can actually customize these lessons and make them more engaging? Because one of the things that happens, especially if maybe um, you're going through some lessons and you're using the videos a lot, eventually your kids will say, you know, I, I just, I don't want to listen to another video. One of the things that uh, one of my classes said to me one time was, Oh, Ms. G, I don't want to listen to that guy's voice anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever told Jeremy that story or not, but, <laughs> but that happened to me one year and I thought, okay, let's change this up. It's time. So it's always good to think about things that we can add into these different lessons. Um, Carol Cantor and Wright happens to be one of my favorites, one of my favorite introductory lessons, because this is where we really get kids to start thinking about how they're going to teach Carol some more commands. And they're really getting started in learning about functions, learning about commands, and uh, doing a, getting into their programming a little bit more deeply. And so I like to take a look at this one in particular and really think about how we can change this up. So if we head back out, glance at the time really quick. It's coming down there again because I do this every single time <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> so Carol Can Turn Right is the third lesson in programming with Carol. This is one that I really do like to change up. Some of the times that I approach a lesson, I don't want to start with the video at all. I don't want to start with a video. I don't want to start with the slides. I want to have the kids do something and I want to have them do something other than the check for understanding quiz. So some of the ways that I can approach this is with a really, really cool engagement tool that I want to just walk through and show you all how to use. So this is where I would bring in collaboration and some pair programming or some group programming. And I would do that with the sandbox. So to get to the Code HS sandbox, I'm going to move my mouse up to the top left-hand corner of my screen where it's a sandbox and click that. So here is where you're going to see all the sandbox programs that you have created. So you might not have any here yet. You might have a few here. But you can organize your programs by folders, by class periods if you want, and you can create your own programs here too. Know that your students also each have a sandbox of their own. And teachers, you can all view the sandbox. So you don't have to worry that kids are doing something there that you can't see. You will be able to view their content. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new program. I'm going to call this one, um, call it Bell Ringer. I'm going to click Create Program. And now here's where you can choose the type of program that you want to write in your sandbox program. So you have a lot of things to choose from. You've got different types of JavaScript, Java, so much Python. 
makes my heart so happy. I love Python, <laughs> HTML, C++, SQL, and then uh, different languages that we don't even have courses for. Um, but processing is amazing, by the way. If anybody wants to check it out, it's a really cool uh, language to check. Swift is also a possibility here. And you're going to see some other things popping in here in the very near future. So keep an eye out for that. So I'm going to go ahead and start a Python 3 program. Then I'm going to click Create Program. And this is going to pull up my sandbox. And I already see something that's going to happen with this. And I'm not sure why it's not sticking. So I might have to do something with this. But I can now type my own program here. Maybe I want to make another print statement. There we go. Tell everybody, hey, what's up? Oops, that's going to be cranky. That's all right. We'll figure that one out later. Oop, then I took that out. Okay. So I can write my own program, but what fun is that? I want to do a review of some other content. I so should have picked JavaScript. That's okay. I'm going to now collaborate with others on this. So to do that, I would click this collaborate icon on the left-hand side of the screen. And if you see this error, there's a couple of ways to fix it. It's not really an error, it's just a message. We do have a couple of different coding editors. And so if you see this message, you can move your mouse up to the settings icon and you can change it. There we go. Now we'll go back to collaborate. So when I start a sandbox program, it starts out with collaboration disabled. So I can come in, enable collaboration, click the collaborate link and then I can send that link to all my friends and they can click on it and join me in my coding sandbox and I would love it if any of you would like to join thanks Dave Dave's going to be my coding buddy <laughs> and so you can see here whoop, as people are joining you can see our icons up here so cool <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, awesome, Jeffrey. You're our coding buddy too. So yeah, feel free to jump in and go ahead and I'll make some extra lines. There we go. And go ahead and you can code away. You can copy paste if you don't know Python. This is a really, really cool way to um, get kids working together and being comfortable being collaborative with each other. This is a really amazing tool. Look at Dave's getting fancy. <laughs> I didn't even use my escape character for that apostrophe I made. <laughs> I love it. That's so cool. Let's go ahead and run it. Ah, oh, syntax error. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Don't do this with your students. <laughs> but this is such a good way to get your kids working together and collaborating together. And this is much more engaging than simply going through activities on their own. So I love doing this and it's such a good way to teach programming too. I would not recommend putting, uh, putting this or making one sandbox for your entire group of students if you have a large class. I often had 35 kids in a class at a time, and yeah, that would have been a nightmare. So I would suggest at that point, you could either have your kids make uh, their own sandboxes to share, or you could make multiple ones, but it gets a little bit tough when they are, um, when they, you, if you might have 35 kids in one, they might have to run that again. So cool. And you all, yep, Dave reminded me. So I'm not going to see this on my side because I created it. But on your side, you're going to see a fork button. And if you click fork, you'll be able to make a copy of this sandbox and use it for yourself. And anybody can fork a sandbox. What's really cool is uh, we actually have a lot of workshops done by other CodeHS teachers and teacher trainers who make their own programs. And when you do those workshops, those teachers are 
so generous and they just say, here, have my program. And you can fork those, you can learn from them. They're really amazing. So cool. Yeah, whenever you fork it, it will go to your sandbox. I knew Dave would save this. This is the best one ever. So <laughs> I'm going to say I was born in Peru. That's a lie. <laughs> but <laughs> I was born in the United States. All right. So cool. Love this. But I do love sh sharing this with people. This is a really nice, easy thing to do. Uh, as part of your your course and the other thing you can actually do it's a fabulous class starter I absolutely love this I'm going to go back over to that section I think I got completely out of it if you want you can even give kids if you don't want kids to collaborate this is a little tip I also give teachers currently we don't have a way to shut off collaboration but if you want to use sandbox or maybe you want to use a typical pair programming kind of situation. One of the ways you can do that is by adding a new assignment and then adding a coding exercise. This is not a coding exercise that you necessarily have to write. So if you're not feeling comfortable writing a coding exercise for your kids, you can choose this. Um, I'm going to say this one is going to be just Carol. And I shouldn't say just Carol, but it'll be introductory Carol JavaScript. I'm going to say um, make program and kids then can be very creative with whatever they create. So write a new Carol program. I would give them much better instructions, but that works for now. I'm going to click save. I could even make some Carol worlds. We don't have enough time to get into that today, but if you click advanced settings, you can actually make your own worlds. You could add starter code. Or you could say something like, here are the instructions. That's a comment, so it won't count in anything. You can add solution code if you want. If you have Pro, you can configure it. And then we can see what it does. And now kids can create their own program. There's no auto grader. They can simply create and run this in the progression for the lesson and they are not able to um, easily collaborate on this so that's kind of a nice little option as well all right since I'm getting too excited about sandbox I'm going to buzz through that <laughs> but that's a basic introduction about how to use the sandbox one of the things that I wanted to mention here and I'm not going to get very into it but I'm going to mainly focus on that eye that you see on the screen, there is a lesson planning strategy called PRIM. The reason I bring this up in a rural CS uh, workshop is because this is a fabulous way to build additional engagement in your lessons. The P in the PRIM framework stands for predict. And uh, another reason I bring this up is because very often we might have students who don't have internet access when they leave the school. Um, I know that's a huge issue in my state. It's a huge issue in many states. It's also an issue in Georgia. So if you've got those kids who don't have internet access, we want to think about what are some ways that we can do this offline. When this student leaves the school, they might not be able to get online again. So predicting in our lessons, in our coding lessons, is going to become really important. And it's important anyway. But if we think about how we want to teach programming, before we have kids just launch in and try to write programs in a language that is entirely different, we want to provide that scaffolding for them. So if we have them read a program, discuss a program, and predict what it's going to do, they don't need a computer. They can simply read that code and write a prediction for it. A computer is not necessary at this point in the process. And this provides them with a perfect stepping stone to get them started learning the complexities of a programming language. The R stands for run. So in this one, they might need to run this program, but you still might have some other ways that you could even work through this as well. Investigate is one of my favorite stages of PRIM. 
There's so many different activities that you can do that do not require screen time at all. And I think these could translate also into those at-home activities that kids might be working on as well that don't require any kind of connection, any kind of broadband. So this is where students are really going to be investigating that code. This is another great scaffolding strategy that you can use with those examples in the coding exercises. You can do code tracing. You don't need to have the computer for that. You can hand students a piece of paper with code. Explaining. This is something I did often with kids. We would read that code, then we would explain that code because that's how they're going to learn what that code means. And it, we demystify all of that crazy syntax by explaining it. Annotating as well is something that could be really helpful. If you've got kids who maybe aren't the strongest um, writers, you can make this be any range of uh, activity. Maybe they're going, you want them to write about it, but maybe they just need to annotate it. This can be an online or an offline activity. There's no reason this has to occur on a computer. This is even something I've done on a whiteboard in front of the room where I would even just project the code and kids would come up with either magnets or they would write with the white uh, the expo markers or they'd use post-it notes to explain what was happening in the code. And even debugging does not necessarily have to start off as an online activity. There can be a lot of other ways to approach this. The last two stages, and I'm gonna mention these just to round out PRIM, but the last two stages of the PRIM framework include modify, where students are now at a stage where once they've predicted, they've tried some things out, they've explained things, now they're ready to start modifying some existing code. They're still not taking complete ownership of it, but they're modifying it. And finally, in that final stage of PRIM, they are ready to step in and write their own code and really take ownership of their learning. This stage comes at different times for different kids. So this is not something I would push, and I certainly wouldn't even push it for a single lesson. Um, it depends on the student. But I wanted to talk about this be specifically because of all of these offline options. This is definitely something that could be very useful for your students. Interdisciplinary CS is another really great way to engage kids. So often we really need to figure out how to make those connections for our students, help them understand that, hey, whatever you're gonna be doing, computer science needs to be a part of it in any field. And so interdisciplinary is gonna be a really great way to do that. Now in Georgia, of course, you've got all of those courses available to you. There's also a ton of interdisciplinary options that you could embed in there as well. And there's a ton of ways you can use interdisciplinary in your classes. I love to get kids involved in the, the part of the course where maybe they're just simply doing some more outreach with other classes. They're showing other kids what they can do. And so this can be a really great option. You can run a project for a non-CS class. I did this often, but I would have my kids do it. My kids would always be the ones who would run these other projects. Um, you can also provide your own guidance and support to another teacher. You can co-teach with another department, or you could even have a workshop or a competition at your school. Um, then we also have a ton of different career options as well. Coding in the Wild blog is a really cool blog that we have that goes into a bunch of career um, career choices for kids. Let me go ahead and open this. You can take a look. Of course, we have coding in education, coding in the wild for elementary, coding for AI, coding for video marketing, coding for coding for cloud accounting. Uh, oh, cool. Powerhouse female coders. Uh, coding for air purification systems. There are so many. This is one I could have actually used uh, when I had some, some uh, students who just felt like Block coding was not real coding. And I explained to them, no, block coding is used in industry all the time. So it is used everywhere. Um, but tons of blog posts for how coding is involved in all aspects of our world. And this really shows that, hey, kids, there is a place for you in this. What do you want to do in your life? You're going to need to know how to code. 
Um, we also have a career center. This is pretty new. I think we're coming up on a year now for having this career center. So for CTE, I think this is something really indispensable for bringing into all of your content areas, but you can definitely see that we have a huge range of different areas uh, for students to consider how computer science and how coding can play a role in that. Um, so this is going to be something you'll definitely want to check out. Um, I love the sports one. I do like to point this out because I've had many students say, I'm going to go into sports management or I'm going to do this. Well, you might need some computer science and some coding for that as well. It can help you. We also have an additional project catalog. So many of the courses that are included in the Georgia Pathway are project-based. You're going to find project-based learning in many of the web development pathways, the web design pathway, game design, um, so many of them. And I think even Intro to Hardware Technology has projects built in. Intro to Software Technology has those projects as well. If you're looking for additional projects, to really connect that learning with your students and get them engaged with something that they feel passionate about, take a look at the project catalog. This is gonna be another awesome option for them. You can get to the project catalog from the link that Dave threw into chat or in the CodeHS uh, platform. You can also see the project catalog in this handy dandy navigation bar on the left-hand side of your screen. Also, some other options, and these are absolutely outside of CodeHS. If you have never checked out some other organizations to help engage kids, you need to take a look at these. ncwit.org is the National, what is it, National Center for Women in IT, and they have a program called Aspirations in Computing. Um, this Aspirations in Computing does a ton of awards for um, high school girls. And it is one of the most phenomenal programs I've ever been privileged to be a part of. I started off my own experience with NCWIT with one student one year who happened to win for North and South Dakota. And from there, I had three students and it just kept growing until this was the group of kids that I took the last year that I was at my school. and. It makes me so happy still to look at that picture. And I look at that, uh, the blonde standing on the, close to the end here. And she was a student who looked at me and said, at the beginning of the year and said, Ms. G, I'm not good at this and I don't like it. I'm gonna do the best I can because I wanna do well, but I don't like it. And that was where she ended up. That is what NCWID and Aspirations can do for your kids. So. I'll stop preaching, but it's an amazing program. So I highly recommend take a look at this and you will want to take a look very soon because aspirations will start accepting, uh, they'll start accepting applications in September and I'm not sure how long they'll go. So take a look at aspirations.org, get your kids excited about it. This is an amazing opportunity. Girls Who Code is another really awesome option. And there's so many groups like this, Girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code, so many different organizations started up. This is an awesome option for your kids. Those are also two of my students just coding away. They were, I think they were, they've got a Raspberry Pi under something there. Uh, but I absolutely love this organization. I kind of, I should wore that shirt today. I still have it. So <laughs> awesome organization. And for those of you who need a little bit of money, Girls Who Code has a little bit of funding that goes with it. A um, couple other things I'm going to point out really fast. I think I'm going to save this so I can show everybody how you do this tomorrow. Co-teach with another CS teacher using Code HS. One of the issues we have in CS, whether you're rural or urban, is that CS teachers feel such isolation because we're usually the only teacher in our district. I'm going to show you how you can co-teach with another CS teacher using CodeHS. I did this all the time. I co-taught with teachers from around my state. And you are not restricted to just teachers in your state. You, 
You could co-teach with the teacher in your school, around your state, from other states, maybe from around the world. Ooh, that would be a cool program. We should look into that, Dave. We need to connect teachers. That would be amazing. So I'll show you all how to do this tomorrow. I showed you a little bit right here, but I'll walk through it tomorrow. And connect with other colleagues and community members as well through different organizations. Get involved in those state organizations, all those that you have. Georgia, you've got so many. You have an amazingly active CSTA, Georgia, uh, local chapter. You have uh, CS for all or CS for Georgia. You have a ton of things you could get involved in. And we've got some Code HS groups you can get involved in as well, too. Attend those conferences. I did put a link here for CSTA, the national uh, conference. This is an amazing one. I left this one this year feeling so inspired, so I recommend it to everybody. And I listed some of the other items here as well. So, and each of these I do believe has a link if you click on these images. So CSTA Georgia, if you're not in CSTA, you can absolutely join CSTA for free. You can join the CSTA plus, I think for $50, but then you can join your CSTA local chapter. Um, I have included CarolCon because <laughs> Code HS does do a virtual workshop as well. CS4GA is huge. You'll definitely want to take a look at this website. And Georgia Tech has a couple of amazing organizations. Um, so you'll want to take a look at Constellations at Georgia Tech and the CEISMC uh, organization as well. Both of those are fabulous in terms of helping provide additional support and professional development for computer science teachers. And I made a special slide for this one because this is a little community that I'm working on uh, getting a little bit more activity in. And I thought, let's start with our cool Georgia teachers. So if you uh, head out to codehs.com slash community dash connect, this will invite you to join our Slack uh, community of teachers. And I'm gonna go ahead and post uh, some of the Georgia resources there. Um, we've had a few people join this. Uh, so yeah, definitely head out. This is another great way to stay connected with Georgia teachers or teachers from around the US and the Code HS team. Uh, a few other things to leverage for uh, Code HS or leverage for professional learning are, of course, some Code HS resources. We've talked a little bit about how we can use Code HS for your own professional learning. Keep an eye on our free PD page, codehs.com slash free PD to register for any and all events. We have a ton of things that come up. Um, and we also have a PD membership as well. And I think I've got that link handy, Dave. So I'll throw that one in. Maybe I do. There we go. And then I'll give you some information about the PD membership that we have available now too. We'll, I've linked a bunch of funding opportunities here. Um, definitely take a look at your state-specific resources. As CTAE teachers, you have a ton of resources. And the state of Georgia does an amazing job with rural school districts. I cannot get over how much Georgia is doing for its schools. So definitely take a look at some of those resources. And as you're thinking about, oh, there's, there's so many things, or you might be feeling overwhelmed with the start of the school year coming up, I want you to keep in mind that this is also a quote that I really enjoyed seeing. And I think this one was from, um, this might've been from the CSTA, one of the CSTA surveys, that 81% of teachers, 81% felt that they had influenced the growth of CS within their school or district. The amount of impact you can have on your kids' lives, whether you're in a rural school district or another school, is immeasurable. So keep that in mind as you're pushing forward on what's probably a very new venture for you in teaching. And just remember that impact that you're gonna have on those kids. I've listed a ton more resources here, same kind of resources um, that you may have seen in some of the other workshops. So some Georgia specific things, Code HS specific things. There's that Code HS certified educator. Again, I so want to see new certified educators from Georgia. So I'm going to be watching that list. I might be sending some emails saying, hey, did you apply yet? So 
just saying <laughs> it's a cool cool thing to do so please please jump into that a little bit more information about our PD membership and we have one more Georgia workshop coming up tomorrow and that one is going to be platform focused so come prepared to set up and get ready for your new school year preparing Georgia teachers for the new school year with code HS same time tomorrow if you are not registered yet head out to codehs.com slash free pd to register and i totally took us way beyond time i'm so sorry <laughs> thank you for hanging with me you all are awesome if you could take a moment to fill out our workshop survey that would be great codehs.com slash workshop survey <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you need like a very <laughs> long stick to right, Lori. <laughs> no. A long stick. That's pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And I so hope that we get to see you tomorrow at our next Georgia workshop. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lori. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>